Hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome to Scottish Pen's event marking Pen International's Day of the Imprisoned Writer for 2021. I'd like to offer a particular thanks to our colleagues from English Pen and Reporters Without Borders, Kat Lucas and Rebecca Vincent, for agreeing to be part of this event, and also for their ongoing work in supporting writers and their rights. We're grateful for this opportunity to strengthen the bonds among our organisations. There's always a sense of sadness that we have to hold events like these, but of course, that is the nature of the work that Reporters Without Borders and Penn International and its chapters around the world do. Having said that, I've always found as a member of Scottish Penn, then, then as co-chair and then chair of our Writers at Risk Committee, and now moving on to the position of chair or president, that the events we hold on the day of the imprisoned writer go to the heart of one of the strands of the work we do. And I know that I've emerged from these events in the past, energized and keen to do more to further our goals. Penn International summarizes part of its charter as stating that Penn stands for the principle of unhampered transmission of thought within each nation and between all nations. And, men and members pledge themselves to oppose any form of suppression or freedom of expression in the country and community to which they belong, as well as throughout the world, wherever that is possible. Today, we raise awareness of some examples of such suppression, and we encourage our members, and indeed anyone, to take some small action to oppose the suppression of freedom of expression at home and around the world. In preparing the readings for tonight's event, in collaboration with our colleagues at English Pen and Reporters Without Borders, we were very aware of the recent award of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize to Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov, and particularly the Norwegian Nobel Committee's accompanying statement that the award was made for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. By extension, the imprisonment of writers for attempting to exercise their right to freedom of expression is an assault on democracy and, pre and, and peace. We'll be talking this evening about the cases of Maria Ressa, Nadim Torfent, Daphne Caruana Galizia, and Anna Politskovskaya, Vara Vara Rao, and Amit Alton. But I'd encourage you to recall that while each of these cases is important in its own right, they're illustrative of any number of unique but similar cases around the world. As Lisa mentioned, there's a chat function as part of the app that's carrying this event. And as we proceed, Lisa will be sharing links to the cases of each of the writers we're discussing, as well as some other related cases. We will also be sharing a link to Penn International's Day of the Imprisoned Writer campaign for 2021. And the writers Penn International is focusing on today and over the next four days. We'll be sharing links to the cases of other writers that Scottish Pen has been campaigning for over a number of, year, number of years, Raif Badawi and Ashraf Fayyad. Finally, we'll be sharing a link to Pen America's Freedom to Write Index for 2020, which provides a count of the writers, academics and public intellectuals who were held in prison or detention during 2020 in relation to their writing or for otherwise exercising their freedom of expression. There's a map of the world on the Pen America page that you can hover over with your mouse, hover over, that you can hover over with your mouse and learn about the number of writers imprisoned in different jurisdictions and who those writers are. I'm sad to report that when the index is updated for 2021, the jurisdictions of Scotland and England and Wales will be listed as having together two writers in prison. For context, in the 2020 index, Russia is listed as having one writer or intellectual in prison, and Spain is the only country in Western Europe which holds two writers or intellectuals in prison. Tomorrow, after tonight's event, we will also be sending an email message to the attendees with these same links. If you feel able to join with us in taking one small action to support imprisoned writers here and around the world, we would certainly be grateful. Now, without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Rebecca Vincent, the Director of International Campaigns at Reporters Without Borders, who has recorded a message and a reading regarding Nobel Laureate Maria Ressa. Thank you.
Jason, the Director of International Campaigns of Reporters Without Borders. Greetings from RSF's Paris headquarters. Um, I'm honored to be able to share a reading uh, with you tonight. So this is an excerpt from a speech that Maria Reza gave on winning uh, the World Press Freedom Prize this year. And of course, now we're so proud of Maria, who is also now this year's one of this year's Nobel Peace Prize laureates. But she still has a quite precarious situation in the Philippines where she's facing a range of criminal charges that could see her imprisoned for decades. Um, so she very much still remains at risk. Although she's not a writer currently in prison, there is that risk now. And we hope that in continuing our campaign to help Maria hold the line in the Philippines and in sharing um, this reading tonight, uh, that that will help to give her some more international support and protection. This is a time when lies and incompetence kill. In less than two years, the Philippine government filed 10 arrest warrants against me. In 2017, government propagandists tried to trend the hashtag arrest Maria Reza. They failed, but they kept at it. And two years later, I was arrested twice in a little more than a month. They violated my rights when they prevented me from posting bail and detained me overnight. I suppose they wanted me to shake and feel their power. To the budding dictators of this world, if you have to abuse your power to make you feel powerful, you're not powerful, just abusive and small. What I and other truth tellers in the Philippines have lived through has given us firsthand experience of how the law and law enforcement have been turned against our people. Now, more than ever, power and money rule. In 2016, four months after Duterte became president, Rappler and I wrote investigative pieces showing you how the first casualty in our nation's battle for truth is the number of people killed in our brutal drug war. That violence was facilitated and fueled by American social media companies. Based on big data analysis, we reported the networks that were manipulating us online, targeting and attacking truth tellers, pounding to silence anyone challenging power, which created an extensive social media, uh, social media propaganda machine. Five years ago, we demanded an end to impunity on two fronts. Duterte's drug war and Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook. Today, it has only gotten worse, and Silicon Valley's sins came home to roost on January 6 with mob violence on Capitol Hill. What happens on social media doesn't stay on social media. Online violence leads to real world violence. Since 2016, I have felt like Sisyphus and Cassandra combined, repeatedly warning that our dystopian present is your future. American biologist E.O. Wilson said it best, we're facing paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Social media, with its highly profitable micro-targeting, has become a behavior modification system, and we are Pavlov, Pavlov's dogs experimented on in real time with disastrous consequences. Facebook is the world's largest distributor of news, and yet studies have shown that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than really boring facts. The social media platforms that deliver the facts to you are biased against facts, biased against journalists, biased against meaningful conversations. They are, by design, dividing us and radicalizing us. This is not a free speech issue. It's not the fault of its users. These platforms are not merely mirroring humanity. They are making all of us our worst selves, creating emergent behavior that feeds on violence, fear, uncertainty, and enabling the rise of fascism. Think of it like this. Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust, we have no shared reality, and it becomes impossible to deal with our world's existential problems. The coronavirus climate, the atom bomb that exploded in our information ecosystem when journalists lost gatekeeping powers to technology companies. Tech abdicated responsibility for the public sphere and couldn't seem to fathom that information is a public good. Women, people of color, the LGBTQ, those already marginalized became even more vulnerable, as you'll see in the UNESCO report, The Chilling, whose lead author, ICFJ's Julie Pizzetti, convinced me to speak up when my attacks began many years ago. Of course, there's a cost to speaking truth to power. On Christmas Eve two years ago, Amal Clooney sent me an email. Until then, no one had really had the time to go through the many ludicrous charges that I'm facing and their penalties. Turns out I could go to jail for the rest of my life. By her last count on paper, it was more than 100 years in prison. So I dealt with the sinking feeling in my stomach. This is my lawyer telling me that, right? I took away a lesson. Don't open an email from a mall on Christmas Eve. Sometimes you just have to laugh. Believe it or not, I'm lucky. 
When you're the target of attacks, you're the only one who sees it all, but you can also see exactly how the tactics change. Knowledge is power. And because I spent two decades of my career outside the Philippines, the international community knows me, the quality of my work, my values, my work ethic. So many others aren't so lucky. Like 35-year-old Richie Nipomuseno, who accused the police of extortion, torture, and rape. She was one of at least three Filipino women who filed charges against 11 policemen who they said held them inside a secret room at a police station. Less than two weeks ago on April 19th, Richie was walking down the street when she was shot and killed. Human rights activist Zara Alvarez and another colleague were set to testify against the government and the military. She went as far as asking for court protection, which was at first denied and is still on appeal. Last August, she was walking home with her dinner. She had just lost it when she was shot and killed. So was her colleague. No one is left to testify. I could go on. Now let's go to the journalists. Frenchie May Campillo, still in jail, celebrated her 22nd birthday in prison. Arrested and jailed more than a year ago, it is a familiar tactic. Get an arrest warrant, do a raid, then charge with possession of illegal firearms and explosives, a non-bailable offense. That's also what happened to Lady Anne Salem, another young journalist. Arrested last December, Salem said that the police planted evidence in her apartment, but another judge violated her arrest warrant. It still took time before she was released, forcing her to spend three months in prison during a pandemic because she's a journalist. It's not a coincidence that these victims are women. This February, Senator Leila de Lima, whom Amnesty International calls a prisoner of conscience, began her fifth year in prison. She calls it lawfare, when law is used as a weapon to silence anyone questioning power. That cuts, or the cuts to democracy are bleeding. They're overwhelming and can't be ignored. Last year, two days, just two days after World Press Freedom Day, Filipino lawmakers nudged by President Duterte shut down ABS-CBN, once our largest broadcasting network, our largest news group, also headed by a female journalist. Thousands lost their jobs. Around the same time that Hong Kong passed its draconian security law, the Philippines passed an anti-terror law that sparked 37 petitions at the Supreme Court to declare it unconstitutional. Under that law, anyone some cabinet secretaries called a terrorist could be arrested without a warrant and jailed for up to 24 days. Here's one last fact. More lawyers have died under the Duterte administration than in the 44 years before he took office. So here's the thing. Our problems can't be solved from the Philippines alone. Again, something I've said repeatedly, what's local is global and what's global is local. As we face the coronavirus, there's an equally dangerous and insidious virus of lies unleashed in our information ecosystem. It's seeded by power wanting to save power. Spread by algorithms, motivated, created for profit, a business model Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. The, re the reward is your attention, and all this is linked to geopolitical power play. Last week, the EU slammed Russia and China for their intensified vaccine disinformation campaigns. Last September, Facebook took down information operations from China that were campaigning for the daughter of Duterte for president. Next year, our presidential elections, that network was creating fake accounts for US elections, and it was attacking me. The virus of lies is highly contagious. They infect real people who become impervious to facts. It changes the way they look at the world. They become angrier, more isolated. They distrust everything. In this environment, the dictator wins, crumbling our democracies from within. I became a journalist 35 years ago when, pe when people power in the Philippines helped spark uh, dem democracy movements around the world. I had the great privilege of reporting on much of Southeast Asia's transition from one man authoritarian rule to democracy. Inevitably, there is this one moment when power and money chooses status quo or change. In the Philippines in 1986, it was an elite family's banner at a protest rally that helped open the floodgates that ousted a dictator. In Indonesia in 1998, months of student protests led nowhere until the business community and the military stepped in, ending nearly 32 years of Suharto. Those with power and money must choose. Ask yourself these questions. Who are you? What do you stand for? What kind of world do you want in the ne next decade? The more you have, the more you must risk because silence is complicity. Whether you're at the UN or heading a nation or a corporation, or you're a politician, human rights worker, a journalist or a citizen, fight and win your individual battle for integrity. At stake is our collective global future. Please act now. Courage on. Thank you.
Okay, so um, now I think we're going to move on to our next reader, which I'd like to welcome Kat Lucas, who is the Writers at Risk Programme Manager at English Pen and also leading on their Pen Rights campaign at the moment. You can find out more about that on the English Pen website. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Kat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you, Ricky. It's really um, wonderful to be working with Scottish Pen on the event this evening um, and to be collaborating with you guys more broadly on our, on our uh, common goals. Um, I'm really honoured to be reading on behalf of Nedim Turfent today. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about him and then I will share a couple of his poems in translation. Um, so this month marked the 2000th day of detention for Nedim Turfent, a Kurdish poet and journalist and an honorary member of English Pen. Nedim was arrested on the 12th of May in 2016 after reporting on Turkish Special Forces ill treatment of Turkish, Turkish and Kurdish workers. The day after his arrest, Nedim was charged with membership of a terrorist organization. And at a show trial intended to punish him for his truth-telling journalism, the court sentenced him to eight years and nine months in prison. Despite the fact that 20 of the witnesses called in her of the, of 20 of the witnesses called in his trial, 19 have since said that their initial statements against him had been untamed under torture. He remains in detention more than five years later. Nedim is a key case of concern for English Pen and many of our sister centres around the world. He's also among the writers that we're highlighting through the Pen Rights campaign that Lisa mentioned, which is our international letter writing campaign in solidarity with writers in prison and at risk. Nedim has spoken very movingly of just how much the many messages of solidarity he's received from Pen members of support and from pen members and supporters have meant to him, saying, I want you to know that your letters, which have rendered iron curtains meaningless and ineffective, have filled my two step long cell with resistance, resolve and hope. I hope that you will all take a few minutes to write to him and other writers we're highlighting through the campaign after tonight's event. While in prison, Nedim has written a collection of poem, uh, poetry, uh, forgive my pronunciation for any Turkish speakers, but Kushan Nasa, which means bird mirror. Um, I'm really delighted to be sharing two of his poems translated by our Car uh, colleague Caroline Stockford with you this evening. The first poem is called Following the Traces of You. Loneliness lays its hand on my heart within me. Just there, just somewhere, a gentle twinge, a tender melancholy. How can I explain? In the pitch of darkness, I grapple, struggle with your absence. Your absence, a never ending adventure. I fill blank pages with line after line of the lack of you, scribbling it hastily. To write you, to write down your absence is so hard a thing to do. Striving to write you is like a state of stammering, stuck in its form like a tied tongue. I'm unable to say so, to spell it out on these prolific pages. I exist in the roll call of your absence. Here at the shoreline of my aching eyes, it's easy to say I miss you. Here in a palm-sized cell, your absence is a world's worth of longing. The second poem is called Prisoners Roaring for Freedom. <clears throat> in the last light of evening sun, in its glances that search and stretch on, songs of freedom echoed in anthems, in the cell, its atmosphere tightening. Five to 10 people, arms linked together, in their hearts, deep in their bones, a single voice. Cries woven in that sound and yells, screams of rebellion, late evening, a Saturday in summer, a handful of people holding the line in folk dance formation. A momentous solidarity, coalescence, bodies in chains, the songs at liberty, rising higher and higher, the inner voice of a few men filled the prison. Some newly detained, some nearing completion, resolute together and crying out freedom. A truth in their words that can never be captured, fatigue of captivity there in their bodies, calling as one man, one voice for liberty, in sun's final glances of evening, locked in, but free. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, so next up, we're going to hand over to Lizzie Eldridge, who is a newly elected member of the Scottish Pen Board of Trustees and a member of our Writers at Risk Committee. 
and she'll be reading on behalf of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming here tonight. Ricky mentioned at the beginning the Nobel Peace Prize being awarded to two journalists, uh, which I think is hugely significant. Rebecca read from the work of Maria Ressa. Um, and I'm thinking of the second journalist who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Dmitry Muratov, who dedicated his prize to other journalists, including Anna Politkovskaya, who was assassinated in 2006. Now, I was living in Malta when the journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia was assassinated in 2017. And there are many similarities between Daphne and Anna. Both were incredibly courageous women and they refused to stay silent in the face of corruption, a refusal which ultimately cost them their lives. It's 49 months ago tomorrow, it's almost four, just over four years, sorry, since Daphne was assassinated. And tonight I'm going to read from a piece that she wrote four months before she was killed. It was written just after the last election in Malta in 2017, June, when the Labour Party won for the second time running. It's important to say too that um, there was a groundbreaking public inquiry into Daphne's assassination and it published its report at the end of July this year and its conclusions were categorical. It stated clearly that the Maltese state is responsible for Daphne's assassination and the then Prime Minister Joseph Muscat is responsible for creating the climate of impunity which facilitated Daphne's murder. The Labour Party are still in government today and we are still fighting for justice. I'm going to read from this piece by Daphne, which is called Right and Wrong are Not a Popularity Contest. I wouldn't ordinarily put up a post explaining my absence when I'm going to be away from this site or on it only intermittently for any length of time. But in the present circumstances, I believe I should, particularly because I've received many messages by phone, WhatsApp and email. No, I haven't gone anywhere, though a holiday would be nice. I'm actually working to a deadline on something that's been delayed rather longer than it should have been because of all the distracting action in the last couple of weeks. So as soon as that's done, which will take a couple of days, I'll be back. I know, you don't have to tell me, it's the reason I do it. That this website has, over the last four years, become a gathering point or rallying point for decent people who feel frightened and threatened at the rise, growth and spread of amorality, not by any means the same thing as immorality. I know why you come here, because lots of you tell me, but I knew it instinctively, even before you did. You come here to feel normal in a sea of insanity, where the crowd cheers the commissioner of police for failing to take action against a corrupt cabinet minister and the prime minister's chief of staff. Where supporters of the party in power celebrate and have their picture taken on the steps of a bank which launders money for Azerbaijan's ruling elite because it is linked to the politicians they support. Where even educated people who have had all the advantages in life vote a corrupt political power into power for the narrow reason that they're renting out flats to buyers of Maltese citizenship who never set foot in them. The electoral results shocked you, not because you see general elections as football matches in which the prize is unadulterated power for five years for your team, but because it makes you feel like the only sane person in the asylum. Now you're hunting around for other sane people, temporarily blinded to the fact that 45% of the population made the same choice that you did, though 55% did not. You want reassurance that it is not you who is in the wrong because you think people who do serious wrong should not be in government. No, you are not wrong because you think the police should act. No, you are not wrong to feel sick when the mob cheers a corrupt police officer. Of course you are not, you are right. Four years ago, 
I wrote a piece calling out the incoming Nationalist Party leader for beginning a speech with 30,000 people can't be wrong. Of course they can be, I wrote. A million people can be wrong. The rightness or wrongness of a fact, action or opinion is not established by the number of people who believe it, do it or hold it. Of course it is wrong to vote for corruption. Of course it is wrong to vote so as to put corrupt politicians into power. It is very wrong. And to do it for your own personal benefit, other than simply to back your team, which is bad enough, is worse than wrong. Winning and losing are not factors in deciding what is right and what is wrong. Winning and losing are about the power to prevent wrongdoing or the power to perpetrate it. You would be surprised that the forces of darkness and corruption think themselves the decent ones, despite their necessarily intimate knowledge of what they themselves do. This self-delusion is a coping mechanism, nothing fancier than that. And part of that coping mechanism is using the media machines and other means at their disposal to go after their critics by portraying them as bad and evil, enemies of the people who wish to harm the heroes of public largesse. Why doesn't it get you down? Somebody asked me the other day. How can you cope with an entire Labour Party machine going at you day and night, assaulting you from all angles? How do you deal with it? My answer was what it always is, that the Labour Party, in all its different shapes and forms and under its different leaders, has hounded me irresistibly since I was in my 20s. Yes, for a quarter of a century. The extent of it only became visible to the public with the internet, but it was there beforehand. I can cope not only because I had the good example of my parents to follow, who had to contend with so much that was terrible in the years 1971 to 1987, and who always did so with dignity, correctly, and without moral compromise. But also because I read widely and know that this is a standard textbook fascist method that powerful people use for the public destruction of their critics, particularly when their critics stand alone. Others have been there before me, in situations which require far more bravery and moral courage than has been required of me over the years in Malta. Others are there still, in horrendous situations as they are in Baku, Azerbaijan. What I am put through by the plots, conspiracies and machinations of Joseph Muscat, Keith Shikembri, Glenn Beddingfield, Kurt Perugia, their television station and radio, their internet trolls and the rest of them, is as nothing compared to the hellish nightmare that those brave people must endure in their far more dangerous battles. The fight against corruption and the decimation of the rule of law must continue. The temptation now will be for people to see no way out of this horrible mess and to leap on the bandwagon with the cry that if you can't beat them, then you might as well join them. It happened four years ago and has been happening systematically all along, which is why Muscat's party got the result it did. Meanwhile, remember that yours is the acceptable attitude, and no matter what others tell you, the third world behaviour we are seeing now is not normal or decent, simply because it has won. Malta is in a dangerous place. And now we can no longer say that it is corrupt politicians who have brought it to this point. For it can no longer be denied that those corrupt politicians are a reflection of society. There is something else I should say before I go. When people taunt you or criticize you for being negative or for failing to go with their flow, for not adopting an attitude of benign tolerance to their excesses, Bear in mind always that they, and not you, are the ones who are in the wrong. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Next, we are going to hear from Leela Soma, who 
is going to be um, reading on behalf of Indian poet and activist Baravara Rao. Srila is a published writer and also a newly elected member of our Board of Trustees. So thank you for joining us, Leela, and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thanks to Scottish Pen for this uh, event and to um, hear the speakers about what is happening around the world is quite disturbing. Um, but here is Vara Vara Rao, who was born in 1940, a renowned poet, um, writer, academic, and human rights activist. And he's written powerful po poetry in his native language, Telugu. Uh, Rao has dedicated his life to the protection of human rights and is widely respected for upholding the ideals of truth and compassion. On the 28th of August, 2018, he was arrested on fabricated charges in the Bhima Corrigan case, which had put 16 human rights scholar activists behind bars on charges of terrorism until date, they have not been produced in court to start their trial. Vara Vara Rao was imprisoned in the infamous overcrowded Taloja jail in New Mumbai, where he contracted COVID-19. After frantic appeals from his family, Rao was moved to JJ Hospital, where his visiting family found him delirious and lying helplessly on a urine-soaked bed. On February 22nd, 2021, Rao was granted conditional bail for six months because of his failing health. His situation remains uncertain and the charges against him have not been withdrawn. We've already witnessed the death of the 84-year-old humanist Father Stan Swami in jail in July 2021. We don't want Rao to meet the same fate. We appeal for the dropping of all charges against Vara Vara Rao, who remains an intrepid defender of truth and humanism and hope he'll be able to live the last years of his life as a free man, writing his poems in the comfort zone of his loving circle of family and friends. His poetry has been written since the beginning of his life, so it's been a huge uh, body of work. And there are two poems chosen here. Um, they're translated by his nephew, N. Venugopal. And the first one I'm going to read is called Kavitam, which just means translates as poetry. And it was published in, or it was written, sorry, on the 30th of December, 1987. Poetry. Poetry is the truth that need not be concealed. People who do not need government. Life that doesn't need ambrosia. If you search my pockets, ransack the book and papers on my table and the racks on the shelves, Pry open my flower-like rib cage. There is no secret other than poetry. All my dangerous personality that you do not understand is the secret of poetry. Look carefully. It's like moonlight trapped in a rectangle in an arrogant pose. You look up to insult me. See, my poetry shines in the blue sky as a full moon. You see the moon and are shocked. But surprisingly, the moon cannot see himself in this cell. I used to feel disgusted as swarmed by when you were combing my body. Now, after I outpoured all my blood and transfused it with poetry, to be in company in my solitude. I pity you, thinking your search in my lap is for your lost child of humanity. When you grope around my neck, your metal detector trembles on my chest. 
I surrender myself to you. As if I'm exploring my own secret worlds, uncovering me and peeling my own skin to hear my poetic voice, to feel the attraction and touch into your hands that shackle me. Poetry descends like a heavy weight as you attach a chain. Whenever I move, the noise of soaring free birds. In the daylight of court prosecution, conspiracies come out. You go on surveillance. Poetry gets ignited and continues to fire. You go on governance. Poetry talks about people even in sleep. You throw the net of death and keep waiting. The poetry swims in consciousness just before your eyes. Poetry is an, an, is an open secret that annuls the state. Even as it's taking shape in my heart, it reaches those it has to. It is understood by the deserved unconsciously, even as it's rising in my imagination. It inspires movements. The secret is that my poetry took birth with the movement's first milk. My poetry continues to flow like blood letter, a blood letter stream out of your hands that closed mine, like a broken string of pain and thread of anger, like the sight that lights tears. You can see the anguish in that beautiful, long, very moving poem. His next poem is very similar. Um, but the title is Companion, and the word in Telugu is Todu. And again, it was written in September 1986, and again translated by his nephew N. Venugopal. Companion. Who keeps me company in these premises? The blue sky above, oceans of thoughts within, a shut door and a lock hanging outside, wide open, wide open memories and the patients I'm so used to inside. Are there no human beings here? In which sense, this is solitary confinement to my soul. Trees with fruity minds and flowery hearts, birds like my urge, like my urge for freedom, waiting on the power line to rise up into the sky. Other prisoners find time to stealthily peep in through the crevices of the door. Convicts sneakily wish me on pretext of calling me for court or malakat. Nobody should meet me. Those around me should not speak with me. A forced peaceful coexistence with Congress, culture and the black market. Those speaking with me can't understand my words. Those who understand can't get my anguish. The shadow of this block is prohibited to fall on the, uh, on the other. Who is here to keep me company? A sealed radio and censored newspapers. If the news of an encounter that is only really fake is edited out, that is newspaper. In the solitary silence of the night, jailmates from their radio send me the passion of Piazza and the agony of Maleshwari. Stars tossed in packets of jasmine. They get stones and marijuana packets from the street outside. If you tune radio for news here, you find only death. Death fang on life's struggle, a forced end to the dreams of youth. Waiting is the only company. To the tears that swirl in me, elongated, sleepless nights, sound of tracks in the books that run on my tongue. It isn't noise from the fan, but the outrage of waterfalls within my mind. Black letters 
turn into red blood cells. They enter me and give me renewed strength. As a person who slept amidst rails after intense running, I wake up with broken nightmares. As emotion runs high, my mind in teary thoughts beats Choma's drum. I imagine the phoenix turning to ashes in the peace of a graveyard. In the movement between dawn and dusk, who keeps me company? Foresight supplies breath, conviction on Naxal Berry. There are so many references there, but you can see his anguish on his solitary confinement. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Leela. Um, finally, I'm going to hand back to Ricky Monaghan Brown, uh, who opens our event, and he's going to be focusing on Ahmet Altan. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, just a, a quick little bit of a background information on Ahmet Altan. He is a prominent Turkish journalist and author, a working journalist for more than 20 years. He has served in all stages of the profession, from being a night shift reporter to editor-in-chief in various newspapers, including as the founder former editor-in-chief of liberal daily newspaper Taraf from 2007 to 2012. He has published nine novels and five collections of essays, as well as producing news, pro as well as producing news programming for television. His brother Mehmet was a professor of economics at Istanbul University from 1986 alongside his work as a journalist and human rights defender. Ahmet and Mehmet were arrested in September 2016 in a dawn raid for, a raid for allegedly giving subliminal messages the night before the failed coup earlier that year. They were charged with attempting to overthrow the constitutional order, interfering with the work of the National Assembly and interfering with the work of government through violence or force. The brothers were convicted in 2018, together with four other journalists, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Later in 2018, an appeals court in Istanbul ordered Mehmet Altan's release. His application for his return to his position at Istanbul University was rejected by the State of Emergency Commission uh, a couple of years ago now. Ahmet Altan remains in prison and has subsequently been convicted for insulting the president in an article published in 2016. Despite being denied access to receiving and sending written communications, he managed to write The Writer's Paradox for publication on the eve of his trial in 2017. The Writer's Paradox was published by outlets around the world, including the Society of Authors, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share it with you today. Moving object is neither where it is nor where it is not, implies Zeno in his famous paradox. Ever since my youth, I have believed this paradox is better suited to literature or indeed to writers rather than physics. I am writing these words from a prison cell. Add the sentence, I am writing these words from a prison cell to any narrative and you will be adding a tense vitality a frightening voice that reaches out from a dark and mysterious world, the brave stance of the robust underdog and an ill-concealed call for mercy. It is a dangerous sentence that can be used to exploit people's feelings, and writers do not always refrain from using sentences in a manner that serves their interests when what is at stake is the possibility of touching people's feelings. Even the understanding that this is their intention may be enough for the reader to feel mercy towards the writer of that sentence. But wait, before you start playing the drums of mercy for me, listen to what I will tell you. Yes, I am being held in a high security prison in the middle of the wilds. Yes, I am staying in a cell where the door is opened and closed with the rattle and clatter of iron. Yes, 
and he give me my meals through a hole in the middle of the door. Yes, even the top of the small stone paved courtyard where I pace up and down is covered with steel cages. Yes, I'm not allowed to see anyone other than my lawyers and my children. Yes, I am forbidden from sending even a two line letter to my loved ones. Yes, whenever I go to the hospital, they pull handcuffs out of a cluster of ironwork and put them around my wrists. Yes, each time they take me out of my cell, orders such as raise your arms, take off your shoes, hit me in the face. All of this is true, but it is not the whole truth. In summer mornings, when the first rays of the sun come through the naked window bars and stab my pillow like shining spears, I hear the playful songs of the birds of passage that have nested under the courtyard eaves and the strange crackles that the prisoners pacing the other courtyards make as they crush empty water bottles under their feet. I live with the feeling that I still reside in that pavilion with a garden where I spent my childhood, or for whatever reason, and I don't really know the reason for this, at one of those hotels on the chirpy French streets of the film Irma la Douce. When I wake up with the autumn air hitting the window bars, bearing the fury of northern winds, I start the day on the shores of the Danube River in a hotel with burning torches in the front, which are lit every night. When I wake up with the whisper of the snow piling up inside the window bars in winter, I start the day in that dasha with a front window where Dr. Shivago took refuge. Until now, I have never woken up in prison. Not once. At night, my adventures are filled with even more action. I wander the islands of Thailand, the hotels of London, the streets of Amsterdam, the secret labyrinths of Paris, the seaside restaurants of Istanbul, the small parks hidden in between the streets of New York, the fjords of Norway, the small towns of Alaska with their roads snowed under. You can run into me along the rivers of the Amazon, on the shores of Mexico, on the savannas of Africa. I talk all day with people who are seen and heard by no one, people who don't exist and won't exist until the day I mention them. I listen as they converse among themselves. I live their loves, their adventures, their hopes, worries and joys. And I sometimes chuckle as I pace the courtyard because I overhear their rather entertaining conversations. As I don't want to put them on paper in prison, I inscribe all of this into the crannies of my mind with the dark ink of memory. I know that I'm a schizophrenic man as long as these people remain in my mind. I also know that I'm a writer when these people find themselves in sentences on the pages of a book. I take pleasure in swinging back and forth between schizophrenia and authorship. I soar like smoke and leave the prison with those people who exist in my mind. They may have the power to imprison me, but no one has the power to keep me in prison. I am a writer. I am neither where I am nor where I am not. Wherever you lock me up, I will travel the world with the wings of my endless mind. Besides, I have friends all around the world who help me travel, most of whom I have never met. Each eye that reads what I have written, each voice that repeats my name, holds my hand like a little cloud, flies me over the lowlands, the springs, the forests, the seas, the towns and their streets. They host me quietly in their houses, in their halls, in their rooms. I travel the whole world in a prison cell. As you may guess, I possess a godly arrogance, one that is not often acknowledged, but is unique to writers and has been handed down from one generation to the other for thousands of years. I possess a confidence that grows like a pearl within the hard shells of literature. I possess an immunity protected by the steel armor of my books. 
I am writing this in a prison cell, but I am not in prison. I am a writer. I am neither where I am nor where I am not. You can imprison me, but you cannot keep me in prison because like all writers, I have magic. I can pass through walls with ease. And I think that's a wonderful note on which to end this event, marking Penn International's Day of the Imprisoned Writer for 2021. I'd like to thank everyone who has taken part in and helped us arrange this event. Our readers and writers, Rebecca Vincent, Kat Lucas, Lizzie Eldridge and Lisa Soma. Bishabi Fraser of our uh, Writers at Risk Committee, who's been unable to join us tonight, but has been of great assistance in preparing the programme and the beating organisational heart of Scottish Pen, Lisa Clark. Perhaps most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you who have attended this online event to hear the writing you have shared and learn a little more about the day of the imprisoned writer and the writers we've been talking about. Please do keep an eye on your emails for the additional information we intend to share about these writers, as well as some small steps anyone can take to support imprisoned writers and writers at risk at home and around the world. Thanks also to everyone out there who supports Scottish Pen's work by being a member. Please do keep in mind that there are many ways in which you can be closer to us as a member, whether by joining one of our committees or groups, following our activities on social media, or simply keeping up with our occasional distributions. If you're not a member, or if you have friends who are readers or writers who might be interested in the work we do, we do encourage you and them to join us. You can find out more at Scottish Pen's website, including information on a variety of ways to join us that are intended to fit different types of members and financial circumstance. Thank you again, and have a good week. If you'd like to, please do check out the chat function on your Zoom app before you leave to see some of the links we've shared. Otherwise, when you're done, please do feel free to find a big red button to click on and log out. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>